Hey everyone, I am here today. Do I have an amazing treat for you? Peggy Oki, none other than Dogtown and Z Boys girl. She's amazing. Everybody knows about her. She's a legend and she's here today with us. And she is, this is like what? 1 a.m. in the morning. You are a trooper, Peggy. How are you? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. How are you doing? Uh, I'm fine, Lindsay. Yeah. Yeah, I want to jump right you? in. I want to jump I'm right sorry? in a little background for people that are not aware, like maybe they've been um, living in under a rock or something. But let's watch a little bit of Dogtown just to give people a little reference. Here, let me share before it. Before extreme sports, before the X Games, before it all, there was. Dogtown and Seaboard. This was not the beach that people came to vacation at. This was the last great seaside slum. It was uh, paradise. You didn't go near that place if you didn't live there or know the people because you were going to get hurt. Surfing was it, and skateboarding was just an extension of our surfing. People thought this was some like stupid thing that little kids did. Zephyr team was the most influential skateboard team ever. No one was aggressive or as radical as they ever were. Who we were being paid to ride skateboards? It was crazy. <laughs> Once pool riding came in, that's like all that we wanted to do. So what he did one day, he goes up, pulls the board up, turns in midair, comes back down into the pool, and makes it just change the whole ball game. Dog tunners get to go to Hollywood parties and they get to hang out with rock stars and they break into people's backyards and skate empty swimming pools. I'm in. <laughs> By doing something that everyone said was a waste of time, we ended up influencing kids all around the world. There wouldn't be any X Games if it wasn't for most of the boys that I skated with and competed against. It was unreal. Dogtown and Z Boys. So, Peggy, and you were the one, the only Z girl. I have some photos of you in action here. There you are. Amazing. And you also won awards. Legendary. Legendary. You're in the Hall of Fame. And you took that fame and you put it to use for animals and for the environment and to better man overall. So we have here two. You went from being a skateboard legend to an educator, environmental activist, accomplished artist, surfer, and rock climber. And you have so many projects, we're gonna get into it all. It is so amazing to have you here today. So Peggy, how did you, how do you um, did you ever think that back then when you were doing that, that your life would unfold anything like this? Like, what were, what were, what were you thinking about? What were you gonna do with, at that time? What were you going to be before you got into all of this? Back, back when I was in the skateboarding days, I was a biology major and I, I was studying field zoology, marine biology, and thinking that I was maybe going to be a scientist out there studying dolphin behavior and dolphins in the wild. And ultimately, I, I uh, shifted over to art and got into painting and uh, doing paintings of dolphins. Um, and whales and trying to get a message out through visual art as far as paintings and things, but ultimately decided that I I needed to somehow get a message across a different way because I was also doing other activism and and I felt that the paintings, while there were some nice paintings and, and paintings that also depicted the kind of uh, things that were going wrong in the world with dolphins and whales, that I, that I needed to do something different. So... I ultimately came up with the idea of the Origami Whales Project. Yes. And we have some pictures of that and footage, which I'm going to show in a moment. So here are just a couple of images. And um, let's see, we have, 
I think we have the origami project. We have your TED talk. We have so many different things with you. But why don't you talk about this a little bit, how this all evolved, this project, if you would. Oh, look, you've got a whale behind you. I do have a whale behind me. And that's uh, one of my favorite things in my room here. This is my music room. But um, nice. can you talk a little bit about the project or would you like me to go to, are we allowed to show your TED talk? I was gonna talk to you about this, but we didn't get a chance. Are we yeah, allowed you to? Can actually, you can actually show, I believe, up to about a three second, three to four second clip. Uh, so so when it said what I did, because I thought that's what it said, uh, uh -huh. I put some photos together from it, showing oh, your okay. curtain and your projects. Mm -hmm. So let's walk them through some of these images that we have. Okay, let's talk sure. About that a little bit, if you would. And I'll show some images while you do. Okay. So uh, tell us about how the whale project evolved where it started, the concept of it and so forth. Okay. Yeah, so it, it still started out with me being recognized as a, as a visual artist, a painter. I had a very large oil painting uh, called Private Dawn, and it was uh, about five feet across and it, of, a, of a sperm whale's fluke, which is the same species of whale. There you go. And it's the same species of whale that's, behind your, where you're sitting right there. And it's a sperm whale. And sperm whales are the largest toothed mammal on the planet with the world's largest brain. Uh, they, they're they quite, you know, as far as being largest toothed mammal, they dive to some of the deepest depths of any marine mammal. And they actually uh, battle it out with giant squid, the male the sperm whales, they battle it out with giant squids, which are almost as large as they are, if you if you include the tent length of their tentacles. Oh my god! And of course, they want to eat them, <laughs> and sometimes they win and get to eat a giant squid. So I was really fascinated with them, and I did this painting, and uh, the director of the Santa Barbara Whale Festival had seen the painting, and she loved it and wanted to use it as their poster image for the um, Santa Barbara Whale Festival and asked if they could do that. And and in return, basically, she offered a, a booth for me to sell my art. And I said, okay, great. And I said, have you got children's art going on at the festival? And she said, she said, not really. I go, well, how about if I organize some children's art? And then we had some whale paintings that, that went along with letters to the president at that time, urging him to, um, to, stop the whaling and then the, the couple years later uh, she approached this organizer approached me again and she said would you like to do a children's art thing again i said sure and she said we're going to do origami this time i said well how about origami whales because this is the whale festival and she she loved the idea and uh i also proposed that we come up with a goal number so why not represent the number of whales that were going to be killed that year, unfortunately? And that number was 1,400. So at the, at the booth that we had for the origami whale folding, we had kids come around and people all over. And we, uh, we started to collect these whales. And we got to about, oh, I think about 600. So I still needed about another 800. And I was also in co communicating with... Uh, some of the animal welfare organizations at that time that were campaigning to end whaling. And they, they uh, shared the information on their website and had people mailing origami whales to me. And it took a couple of months, but I was able to get 1,400. And uh, the, the, one of the coordinators uh, said, well, would you like to come and present these whales to the International Whaling Commissioner? And I said, sure. And I had to figure out how. Like, you know, so again, the artist had to put the thinking cap on and how are we going to present uh, paper whales to look like something significant? And I thought, well, maybe I'll just, just put them in some plastic bags. Now that would be silly. Why don't I put these, uh, get some cylindrical plastic, you know, plexiglass kind of tube and put 
all the whales in there, you know, kind of like when you see jelly beans in a jar or something. I thought, well, that doesn't really honor the whales and I don't want it to look like they're in an aquarium. So yeah, I came up with the idea of something uh, like a curtain. And I told a friend of mine who's also artistic and she said, that's a great idea. Come over and do it at our house. Cause she had a really big living room. And literally in one weekend with the help of about five or six other friends that came over, we just worked all weekend and hand stitched the 1,400 origami whales together. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's amazing. And it was so yeah, emotional. I'm sorry. I said it was so representational. I did watch the video and what people, what happened was people thought, oh, what a beautiful, fun kind of to walk through this beautiful thing. But as you started to go through, you became aware that this was representing all of these whales that have been killed. And there were messages on each one. I was hoping I had gotten one of those that when you got close up, you could see the message and it was people started crying, I read. and. Or, or watched and so forth. That is just amazing, an amazing concept. You have a, we want to talk about the Lolita campaign. That's a huge one. But while we're on the artwork, can you talk about mm -hmm. this project? Uh, I'm sorry, while we're on the artwork, you, um, would you repeat that last part for me, please? Yes, this project here uh -huh. is another uh, one of your conceptual art projects or ideas and a uh, work. Can you explain this one a little bit? Um, and and which one would that be? Do you not see it on the screen? I'm sorry. Do you not see it on the screen? Can you not see the screen? I'm putting it up well, on the screen. It's, not, not it's the, the screen. whale tails that you had spoke about. Each one is like our fingerprint. It's an individual, different. That's what I'm. Oh showing. yeah, yeah. So. I'm so concerned that you can't see though. Can you not see there it? There we go. There we go. Okay. So, so in 2007, while I was at the International Whaling Commission meetings with my curtain of origami whales, I'd already put together. What happened was, I started with 1,400 and felt that even though it was a beautiful curtain, and that was over over like 12 feet across and five feet tall that I still needed it to draw more attention to the issue of whaling. And so I brought this curtain of, I, I set a goal, which was really a, um, quite a, quite a large goal of 25,000 origami whales to the international whaling commission meetings in Anchorage, Alaska. And then, while I was working on this curtain with, with the help of volunteers coming every day and me organizing stitching parties in different locations, we would work hours and hours every day to make this curtain happen to go from 1,400 all the way up to 28,000. And, wow. and the goal was 25,000, but then some of my colleague, colleagues said that actually the numbers were coming in in the the number of whales reported killed since 1986, between 1986 and 2007, had come to roughly 28,000. So I said, okay, if I get that many whales mailed to me by all these different people that I'm collaborating with, then I'm going to make this curtain. And um, so we did and went to the International Whaling Commission meetings in Anchorage, Alaska with it and had this incredible curtain that was like a maze that you walk through. Uh, yeah, there we go. And that was in Anchorage, Alaska at the Performing Arts Center. And, you know, literally that that curtain was uh, roughly 30 feet long in sections of uh, that you walk through like a maze and and um, with all the messages written on them and organized by color and such. And, and while I was there with this display, the Japanese government during the International Whaling Commission meetings also announced that they were thinking of going down to Antarctica on their next whaling mission down there and killing 50 humpback whales. Why do they and kill them? Can you tell us a little background? Why are they doing that? For Are you using it for food or why are they killing well, them? Well, yeah, it's, it's really a... a a convoluted thing, the what this whole issue with the whaling, because 
it's it, the 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 Japanese people, and not many of them were eating whale sometimes. But it wasn't like it wasn't like Thanksgiving. You know, eating whales was not like a quote unquote Thanksgiving type of uh, holiday food or nothing actually in a religious ceremony or anything. And yet the Japanese government claimed that it was part of their culture to eat whales. And that I believe was really more around some uh, being some sore losers to, to, to put it, put it bluntly, they were being sore losers about losing out to in, you know, in world war II. And they, the, the Japanese, um, co the country of Japan was very uh, devastated at the end of World War II. There was food shortage and <laughs> you're gonna love this. The US government went over there, they sent General MacArthur over and he basically talked to the Japanese government and said, hey, you've got these vessels still from the war. Why don't you, why don't you use it for whaling? we'll even help you. We'll even let you come out and whale in some of our waters and we'll give you fisheries entitlement, all this stuff. And so the Japanese government said, okay, sure. We'll, we'll eat whales and we'll, and um, then the Japanese government in their fisheries department, they overstepped their boundaries in the fishing agreement that was made and the U S government took it back took back this agreement, took back this offer, and the Japanese government got really pissed off <laughs> and said, okay, well then we're just gonna ramp up our whaling. And, mm. and then that's basically, you know, the, the backstory behind the commercial whaling, which began, you know, like I said, shortly after World War II. And then, um, and then in 1986, the International Whaling Commission, which is basically just like the United Nations, there's no, uh, no, actually, no actual enforcement. They call it a gentleman's agreement, basically, as far as when they meet and they talk about how many whales each country wants to kill and how they're going to kill them and all this sort of thing. Uh, Japan has just been is, kind of a bad boy in the whole, the whole there, thing. Um, is this part of what you're doing, raising awareness? Um, there was an organization that we're going to show uh, in a little while that you gave me a link mm -hmm. to the national uh, mm -hmm. climate change executive order the stakeholder national stakeholder meeting so we'll be talking about that does that tie into how people can help to make this stop happening um i'll have to see i'm sorry i'm, I'm the the audio is not as good on my end i'm i'm sorry because okay. i'm i don't have the best wi-fi where, where i'm located but um yeah, so I had this curtain. I'll, 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 I'm, I hope I'm understanding you correctly, and I'll continue at this moment with the uh, curtain of 28,000 origami whales in Alaska. And then at that time, the Japanese government, during the IWC meetings, they announced that they wanted to go to Antarctica and kill 50 humpback whales. Humpback whales are endangered, and they just figured they'd hold the baby over the barrel, basically to the rest of the countries and threaten them and say, look, we're gonna kill 50 endangered humpback whales next year. And so my response to that was, well, I'm not gonna make 50 origami whales. Why don't I do 50 paintings? And so the, the, the paintings that you showed was a sampling of 50 paintings that I did based on actual photo identification records by researchers that went down to a Antarctica and they have a massive catalog of way more than 50 humpback whales that they've seen over the decades. And, and their way of recording information about each individual whale is by photo identification. As it, and when you look at these paintings, you can see how no two paintings are, are alike. They, the ever, the yeah. images, the, the markings, they, they just show how just like humans, the, the, they basically consider the fluke markings to be like fingerprints on humans. And they, they gave the each whale that they identified down in Antarctica a, a letter, an alphanumerical identification. And then researchers in the North Atlantic or North, Northern Hemisphere give uh, each humpback whale that they see, you know, they take the photos and they actually give them names. But the ones off of Antarctica uh, were were given these numbers, and then I had a, an exhibit of these fifty humpback whale flukes 
uh, in one of my annual shows just to get just to get the point across that that, yeah these are individuals there it's not like a, a world of cookie cutter whales or cookie cutter any animals really because when we look at each individual animal even when it comes down to fish because people and i wondered about that with fish you know they all have personalities they all are individual sentient beings and so that was my message as far as with the whales and the and the japanese whaling and i also did a series of 10 sperm whale flukes and they are of course each different and then i did a series of 27 humpback whale flukes from the northern hemisphere and so i, I continue to do some painting i just wanted to get some of these uh attention drawn yeah. to some of these uh addresses here where they can check you mm-hmm. out the origami sure. whales project and also your website which is peggyoki.com super easy to remember and also we have some petitions we're going to talk about in a moment but let's jump right into the lolita movie okay clip of yeah. that yeah yeah so i you know since 2004 when i founded the origami whales project through you know it began with the santa barbara whale festival and then onward to what it did you know as a global campaign I, I've been, you know, officially fighting for cetaceans, and I started uh, another campaign called "Let's Face It" visual petitions to uh, petition the New Zealand government with photos of of people in, with an image of a Maui dolphin. And the Maui dolphin is critically endangered. There's roughly about 60 left in the whole world, and uh, their main cause of death is drowning in gill nets. Yes, And I think that more people now have seen the documentary Sea Spiracy. It's spelled Mm -hmm. S-E-A-S-P-I-R-A-C-Y. So basically the word conspiracy altered with the word S-E-A. We've done several shows on conspiracy here, actually. We've done several shows on it, so our audience is familiar with Sea Spiracy. Awesome. I just want to jump in. I just want to jump in, Peggy, because I have video yeah, yeah. Of, of these two campaigns. So let me show okay. the Lolita, yep. and then the Let's Face It, you can talk right after, if that's okay. Okay, sure. Yeah, I just wanted to Thank mention the, the Let's Face It visual petition campaign, because after I started that a couple years later into it, maybe three years after starting that campaign, I was, I was already aware of the female orca at the Miami Aquarium, referred to as Lolita. Mm-hmm. And it was really heartbreaking. And I wasn't able to do much for her because I was wrapped up with the other campaigns. But then when things started easing up, I said, I've got to do something for her. And so uh, it, were you wanting to show some kind of photos or video or something? I've got the video you sent me. Okay. Can I okay. play that? Is it? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lindsay.
that is so powerful and sad. Yeah, yeah. When you see the size of the tank, it's like a small swimming pool. Mm -hmm. the it's the smallest tank for an orca in North America. That's incredible. And this is allowed yeah. to continue. I'm sorry. What? This is allowed to, how is this, how is this allowed to continue is my question. I mean, how do they justify that? And what's being done? What are you guys, how are you guys um, wanting help with this? What can we do to help? Well, there's, there's a few actions that people can take. Um, there's, there's definitely a few organizations that are, that are campaigning for her freedom and to raise awareness about the situation of her captivity. Uh, if you go to dolphinproject.com and look at, well, do it, look at, I'd have to get the URL to you, but uh, Rick O'Berry's Dolphin Project has a page regarding Lolita's captivity. Well, yeah, the, they call her Lolita, her captivity at the Miami Seaquarium and how you can contact the APHIS, which is A-P-H-I-S, the Animal Plant uh, Health Inspection Service, and, and then tell them that this tank is too small. As far as standards for being an orca in a tank, they are not really up to that standard. And, and one of the big issues is when you look at that, that image of the tank, there's that, there's that space in the middle with, with it's, it's the, what they call the, I, think it's called, I can't remember the term of the trainings, the training bar or something where the trainers come in and that little island that's in the middle of her tank and, and that being in there, also takes away from the max, the minimum volume of the tank that she's in. Also the depth of the tank. When she in the deepest part of that tank has the top, the bottom of her, her fluke, which is the tail on um, touching the bottom of the tank, she, her head sticks up. It's not even deep enough for her whole body to be submersed in that tank awesome. when she's in a vertical position. Yeah. It, it, it's it's truly horrible. So there there's some the information about writing to uh, the, the the U.S. government about it and complaining and filing a complaint about that. There's uh, the campaigns that that various people have been working on, including myself. I've had a few campaigns for for her freedom and just like coming from these things as an artist, having ideas. We did Christmas for Lolita. We did Valentine's for Lolita, getting people to participate in doing things like sending uh, Valentine's to the corporation that title owns the Miami Seaquarium. We went further with that because the corporation is just very unresponsive. And so we said, okay, we're going to try, we're, we're just going to have to scream louder. <laughs> and so uh, I, I had a letter writing campaign urging people to, to send letters in to me. And then I collected real letters and then sent them, actually we hand delivered them to the Palace Entertainment Corporation corporate office. And that was one of the campaigns. And then since then I've uh, got this new, newer one that we just did. We had a, a, a Twitter campaign that went on for, for two weeks with the Facebook event page and different actions that people take every day, but the actions are still available as options. And I'm posting them on the group page for the uh, campaign page for, for quote unquote Lolita. Her, her original name when she was first captured, she was being, being uh, cared for by a veterinarian that was hired to make sure that all of the captive orcas were healthy to ship off. And, uh, the, I believe his last name was White, and he was very moved by by her courageous nature, courageous and gentle nature. And he came up, he found a um, little curio, little object when he was shopping in the in the area of the Pacific Northwest where they were keeping these young orcas before they were shipped off. And it was it said Tokite, and he. Oh asked about the meaning of it. And there's actually a couple of interpretations on that word, but I like the one that's, that means beautiful waters or no beautiful lady shining water oh. and because she's such an incredible spirit that, you know, like most orcas that are captured or most orcas in captivity, they, the maximum they live is maybe 30, 35 years. And uh, often 
the ones that are captured from the wild, the, they might live at the most 15 years or something. And of course, the, these captive cetacean facilities like SeaWorld and Miami Sea Aquarium and all, they're saying, oh, well, it's much better for these orcas, you know, to be in these, in these tanks. <laughs> you know, this lies, so much propaganda about the captivity situation. And of course, I'm, I'm sure most of your watchers that have watched the documentary Blackfish and seen the horrific conditions and the treatment, the mistreatment, separating uh, babies from their mothers and, you know, just, it just looked like they were mistreating it when they had those ropes and stuff around her and they were all confined around. You could see that they're not, they have no free will. I mean, it's a life, like you say, it's a horrific life. It's a nightmare. And um, if she got released now, she, it says here that she's been there since 1970, 51 years. But her family yeah. is still alive and she could reconnect with her family. I saw that somewhere. Yeah, so so when when men were doing these basic they called them roundups of these orcas, they would periodically go out there with these boats, chaser boats, they even had spotter airplanes. And the guys in these boats, the men in these boats would be throwing, you know, like lighting up flares and and like little explosive devices and stuff to, to frighten the orca pods and, and herd them literally like a roundup of horses. They would herd these orcas into a bay and then seal off the, the opening of the bay with, with nets. Mm -hmm. And then they, they would go in and separate out the calves and the mothers, because the mothers would always stay with their calves and try to protect them. And um, this was happening in the Pacific Northwest and they would generally be, be chasing after the, the Southern resident orcas or the Northern resident orcas. So these were orcas that, that were always found in coastal waters. And when they had traditional times where they would spot these orcas, they would round them up and take away the young ones and sell them off to sequariums. So when she is captured, to, I'm are sorry? Are they allowed to still do that? I thought that that wasn't allowed. They can only breed them. So, yeah, so what happened was the day that, that she, that, that Tokite, also known as Lolita, the day that she was captured, there were four other calves that drowned and a mother orca that drowned because they were separated by these nets. They were trying to get, the, the, the young orcas were trying to get back to their mothers and the one mother was trying to get to her, her child and they all got tangled in the net that had closed off the bay and they drowned. And the, uh, the, the, the boss of this, this captive capture um, group ordered the men to slit their stomachs of the of these dead orcas, slit the stomachs open, fill them up with boulders, um, tie anchors to the flukes of these dead orcas and sink their bodies down to the bottom to hide this horrible incident. And what happened was with the currents and things, these orcas floated up and their bodies were discovered and reported and the, res the, the people in the area had already been protesting about, you cannot take away our killer whales or orcas and stuff. And with this happening, that was the last straw. And, and sadly, you know, at least, at least there was something positive that came out of that, that uh, eventually a law was passed that it was legal for, for anyone to capture and take away these orcas. Wow. So it's, it's illegal now. And so Southern resident orcas is, uh, they're J, K and L pods. And they, they're basically like large family groups. And, and Tokite Lolita was from, taken from L pod. And in L pod, her mother, Ocean Sun, her presumed mother is still alive. She is now getting close to about 90 years old. And female orcas can live in the wild for even a hundred years. There was a member of uh, J-Pod, her name was Granny, 
and she lived to at least 102 years old. So just they're very similar to humans as far as how we can live to be 100 if we stay healthy and um, yeah. But but even 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 more fascinating than humans, they're highly socially organized. The way elephant groups, you know, we're we're, we're more people are aware of how elephants, like the African elephants, live in highly social matriarchal groups where they have an elder uh, female that that leads the whole herd to where they know that there's food and water and resources and safety and 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 directs them when there's a dangerous situation and all this sort of thing. Well, that's what orcas do as well as sperm whales and wow. other animals that that we're only just learning about in in their behaviors and so it's a, it's quite a fascinating interesting uh species the uh, as well as i mean i don't want to get too into the organ into the situation I want to interrupt here i hate interrupting you because it's so fast that you're going to have to come back because we're not getting through everything we do want to show well, the anyway, let, yeah let's let's carry on but yeah she she was a southern resident yeah. orca okay. and um and, and oh, that's another thing. I just want to point out real, real quickly. There's there's ten different ecotypes of orcas, and we're you know in the in the in what we see on television, so these nature documentaries of orcas that that'll chase a sea lion onto the shore and then you know it'll gobble it up and all this. I I was kind of scared of of you know the quote unquote killer whales. I went, oh God, I don't think I want to be in the water with them. But as it turns out, there are. Ten to, at least 10 different ecotypes of orcas. And through these millions of years of, of evolution, they have evolved to eat specific types of food and hunting together for the, these food items, and depending on what part of the world they are. And the Southern resident orcas and the Northern resident orcas of North America, they only eat fish. And not only do they, they only eat fish, it's rather specific in their diet. So the Southern right. resident orcas, about 90% of their diet is a Chinook salmon, which is also an endangered yeah. species. Yes. So quite fascinating, these, these different factors and, and, um, and like how they talk about it one, in sea world, in blackfish, yeah. I'm sorry? You could do a whole show on just this one subject. Yeah, yeah. The orcas, but I do want to jump, move forward because we only have yes. 15 minutes left. Yeah. And I wanted to show your other campaign. Let's show. Seems to me it goes hand in hand. We make a mess and the earth be damned. Well, it's not their fault and it's not our fault. And it all can change. With a little thought. Don't need more stuff, don't need more stuff Just need each other and that's enough well, Is this mess a reflection of our minds? Now we're so unhappy in our quest to slow down time Always thinking, always moving Towards tomorrow, gotta stop and think about the moment. This time we cannot borrow. Don't need more stuff, don't need more stuff. Just need each other, and that's enough. Slow down to see, gotta slow down to see. Mother says, Slow down. No, I'm thinking about reducing everything Scaling back and living clean I feel so much better now Wow, I think that was as long as it would play of it. So can you talk about this a little bit? Tell us what's going on with the dolphin here. Yeah, so they're called Maui dolphins, but it has nothing to do with the Hawaiian island of Maui. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the word Maui is a is name of a Polynesian god and the the Maoris of New Zealand, which are the, the people that, that came to the island of New Zealand, they migrated over, 
Uh, they named these dolphins the Maui or Popoto. There's a few names for them. And that's actually a Hector's dolphin, which is which is the, the main species of, of this dolphin in New Zealand. The Cephalorhynchus hepteri is a scientific name. And uh, aren't it's just incredible how high they can leap and how playful they are. They like surfing little waves. They're they scoot along uh, alongside boats and all these things, just like the larger dolphins in the world do. Uh, they're the world's smallest dolphin, roughly, well, less than five foot in length, a little over four feet in length is their average size. And you can see the very distinctive dorsal fin, which is rounded and the rounded pectoral fin. And uh, they, they're they like a little Mickey Mouse dolphin. They're, they're very cute, uh, but um, unfortunately, they're also one of the most endangered you know, like I said, there are, now the estimate is about 50, uh, 60 of these uh, Maui dolphins left. So the Maui is a subspecies of the Hector. There's roughly less than 3,000 of the Hector's dolphins, which are also endangered. And then again, about 60 of the subspecies, the Maui dolphin, which are found in a different part of New Zealand. And basically the New Zealand government has failed to adequately protect these dolphins. All they need to do is ban the use of gill nets in the known habitat of these dolphins. But the fishing industry, as we know from watching documentaries such as Seaspiracy, the fishing industry is very corrupt and very powerful. And they, they, they've basically been threatening the New Zealand government and saying, if you ban our fishing, we're gonna sue you and this and that, and who knows what else is going on with right. the fishing industry in New Zealand, but it's a really bad one. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I had this let's fish, let's face it visual petition campaign going on uh, for for quite a few years. And it it's still available. Uh, I still I still refer to the site where we have a collection of um, about ten thousand, almost ten thousand photographs that people have submitted of their of themselves with the image of a Maui or Hector's dolphin. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, real, I, I know that we have roughly 10 minutes left and uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for having me on your show. Oh, and I would love for people pleasure. to participate in sending a letter to the corporation that recently acquired the, the large share of Parkes Reunidos. So Parkes Reunidos is a multinational corporation that bought out, that owns Palace Entertainment, which is the North American branch that owns several theme parks, 22 theme parks, and two of them are captive cetacean facilities. One is, is Sea Life Park, they should call it Sea Death Park on Oahu, and then um, the uh, Miami Aquarium. And then under that, it's, you know, above that is Parkes Reunidos that owns Palace Entertainment, which in total in their portfolio of theme parks owns over 60 theme parks. So besides captive cetacean facilities of which they own six in total, they also have some zoos, they have uh, places, oh, in the United States, Raging Waters theme park, that's owned under the title of Palace Entertainment. So I was calling for a boycott pledge of all of these theme parks across the world that are owned under the title of Parkes Reunidos. And if uh, if you look it up on our, our website, we have the, the names of all of these theme parks to boycott. And so one an easy one for people in Southern California is Raging Waters. Uh, and uh, to boycott these theme parks because that would be, if you're not, you're supporting, unfortunately, this horrible industry. Um, sea Life Park in Oahu is also known for notorious for some horrific treatments of the mistreatment of the the dolphins and, and um, dolphins kept at at their facility but as you saw from the as the audience saw from this image of Tokite Lolita kept in that tank imagine your entire life that's not like a stage where she lives in some kind of like a as if as if you have like horses in a pasture, and then they, they get brought out to a stage and, and shown. That's the, that's, that little tank is the only thing she has known for almost 51 years. And yeah. we've just got to get her back home. There, there's a proposed sea sanctuary, uh, very well designed and planned out by Orca Network in the area where she was captured from. 
it, it's not like they would just, you know, put her out in the wild. They would give her a, a, a space where she could have a much more room to swim, to learn, to make sure that she knows how to catch food. This is, we're talking about one of the most intelligent beings on the planet, one of the largest brains, one of the most advanced brains as far as handling emotional um, encounters and stuff. That we're, you know, it, it's so likely that she would make it, and at least, if nothing else, she would have a much larger space in a sea sanctuary. So I, I'm urging everyone to do everything that you can for her. Um, uh, go follow me on the Origami Wells Project um, on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram, and I currently, on my Instagram account, have a, a petition linked to uh, a link in my, in my Instagram profile going to the petition for her. And that petition is to EQT partners that that um, about a year and a half ago acquired Parkus Reunidos, and so we need to we we need to just go go to the top of the ladder and tell them this is not acceptable. It's time to let her retire. Just let her let her have that chance. She's already been in captivity. Anybody who's who's worked fifty years of their life, anyways, right? You know, it's time to retire her. Yeah. yeah. I do have to jump in and say that we invite EQT and the Reyes Park Entertainment on to talk, give their side of the story and dialogue. We, we want to be fair to them as well. Um, so we do have to jump in and say that. And Peggy, we only have a few more minutes left. Yeah. And I want to give out the best contact information so if there's any uh, you want us, is the PeggyOki.com the best to, to send people or the Wea Origami Wales Project? Where would you like us to send them? Uh, yeah, either either one, the OrigamiWalesProject.org or PeggyOki.com. The, 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 those two uh, are linked together on the same website, and there's a contact page. And, of course, if you go to PeggyOki.com, people can – explore more about what I've been doing in my life and uh, including little dog town video clip uh, things and, and right. my, my TEDx talk and public speaking appearances. And, and one of the things I say about this, the fame, you know, and I've never really done anything for the purpose of becoming famous or anything. And they talk about fame and fortune. I didn't get the fortune, but I did get the fame, oh. which, which, you know, <laughs> I just say, I just say, I work it for the whales. Of course, not just for the whales. If I have any opportunity to be a voice for causes, um, and and there are many as far as what we can do in the world, I use that skateboarding fame for that purpose. For that purpose. Wonderful. <laughs> That's wonderful. I just want people to see some of your website here. That's why I'm powering, oh, powering through it. Um, there is the public speaking page, which um, you can watch the all the videos. I mean, if you go to her pe web, Peggy's website, you can find out. So it's it's just you'll want to spend the whole day there because there's beautiful artwork. There's videos. There's everything for you to get busy and take action. Um, you mentioned a couple other women of the world. Did you want me to quickly pop that in there? Um, oh, sure. It, uh, in in the most recent campaign, uh, it, it was several months in the process, and then we launched uh, from June 11th through the 25th, when we were we were very active with our Facebook event page and and uh, lots of tweeting, and the tweet sheet's still available. And uh, I'm so grateful and want to express my gratitude to Women of the World versus Taiji because they have been incredible uh, doing a lot of, of work to create this can this two week just burst of effort and they created the petition which is still active as I said is it's in my it's in my Instagram profile and um, I, I invite everybody to, to please join in we can make a difference we oh my gosh the news in just the past week about these uh, was it Neiman Marcus um, yes. The, uh, the, the story the about the cows. The Canada Goose. Canada Goose. Canada Goose. There's like three or four oh. now that have said they're going to stop doing the fur. It's like, holy smokes. 
activists for all these years have been have been vocal. They've been protesting, and now we're seeing victory, and yeah. that can happen. In you know, we we we're we're going to do this. We're gonna we're gonna continue to work for for Toki Te Lolita's freedom. We're gonna continue. Where everyone's gonna do, follow your passion. Everyone, just follow your passion. Whatever you feel most deeply in your heart about, to go out there and and do that, and and we can see see these victories. It's it's what fantastic news! It was like we got to see the Canada Goose thing, and then we got to see another one and another, and, and literally four now, right? In in about yeah. a week, announcing that they're no longer going to be doing fur. That's so. right. And I have the wrong address here. Let me correct this real quick. It's cspiracy.org. I'm quite sure. I think I had that wrong. I don't want people to get that wrong. But yes, yeah, it's amazing what's going on. And we'd love to have you come back again because we didn't cover everything. We'd love to have you in a, maybe a better time zone for you when you're back <laughs> in the US or in a better time oh, it's zone. It's not one in the morning. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing um, that you are actually, what is it, two in the morning, you say, almost? Well, yeah, it's, it's two minutes before two now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow. but you know, I would say that it's funny because I I do not drink coffee. I rarely drink coffee. Actually, the last couple of nights when I was eating at a, a vegan uh, restaurant, having this incredible vegan dessert, I had to have coffee with it. But I, I generally do not drink coffee or energy energy drinks or anything. I've been vegan for over twenty years, and that's what I attribute to having so much energy, even at two in the morning. So wow. again, you know, talking about veganism, which is the there's so many reasons and uh, of course the the benefits are our health on top of saving the lives of millions of animals that's so. absolutely true and i agree 100 percent. and you are on in wikipedia named as one of the uh, vegans famous vegans so i saw your name in there that's pretty cool so you've been <laughs> vegan a long time as you said and it's easy to go vegan. I understand you cooked on Lunch Break Live as well for us, didn't you? Do a show. I did. With yeah, it was my simple, uh, very good, berry bowl of goodness. <laughs> Ooh, sounds good. Well, Peggy, unfortunately, we're down to our last minute, and so we're going to have to say, please stay on. I want to talk to you, but we're going to go off the air for in the next moment. So, thank you for being on. Um, we love what you're doing, and we are going to share this out. I want to tell people that the links that you mentioned, I will be putting in the comments now because we okay. wait till afterwards. It helps with the views, but all of the links we've shown will be put in the comments. I'll put them in right after uh, the show ends. So people Great. can hang tight and they'll be in there. Okay. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for fitting me into your schedule. I know that we had to do some juggling around to squeeze, squeeze this in so that, that I could talk about the campaign for uh, Lolita Tokite. And again, I'm urging everyone to please go to our petition page and spread the word and, and let's, let's do this. Let's see more victories for all of our, our fellow animal beings. Yeah, that's so, so true. And we can do this. So I'm gonna be doing that right after as well. I think I did a couple of other petitions you have. So I'll make sure I do this one too. And it's so Great. easy, two seconds, two seconds of your time. All right, folks, so we're going to go, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much, Peggy, for being on. It was a pleasure and an honor, and we'll see you folks next time. Take care.